Hi everyone, today uh, we'll be talking about the AI revolution. So before diving into the mathematics of machine learning, I thought it was important to have a little look of uh, uh, where we came from, where we are today, what are some of the issues that we're facing today, and, and how this whole evolution happened. So we start with a brief history of AI. Now there can't be any AI without computers, so when did this all get started? Generally, people consider the Z Z1, Z1 to be the first computer. Now, this particular computer was a thousand kilograms in weight. It had about 20,000 parts and its operating speed was one hertz. Okay. Do you remember or do you know how your computer is? What, uh, 2.5 gigahertz, right? It means that it can perform uh, 2.5 billion because giga is 10 to the power of 9 uh, operations per second okay. in comparison this operation this computer that you see in the image here um, has a clock speed of 1 hertz so really slow um, it was developed by Konrad Zeus uh, hence its name and it had a 64 word memory so each word containing 22 bits so pretty small memory Interesting low, in, interestingly, it contained many of the uh, modern-day parts of a computer. It has a control unit, memory, microservice, sequences, floating-point logic, and input-output devices. In fact, it could be programmed uh, using a punch tape. You know, punch tape is these long ribbons of, of paper with holes in them. Uh, a hole or not would be a bit zero or one. So, if we're looking at the real first successful digital computer, we arrive at the ENIAC. The ENIAC machine was developed in 1946 and it was heralded by the press as a giant brain. An interesting fact about this ENIAC computer is that it was actually operated by using patch cables. So instead of uh, you know, pressing buttons or operating functions in programming code, you had to physically connect one subroutine with another subroutine using an actual physical cable. Now, nobody really knew how to do this job, so six, six women from Philadelphia stepped in to do a job that nobody really understood. So they had to invent, discover and learn how to work this machine without any real uh, training. So these women were actually referred to as computers. That's right, a computer first used to refer to the women operating the computer, not so much the machine. This ENIAC computer was too incomplete. It means that it's able to solve a large class of many different numerical problem, uh, problems because it can be reprogrammed. Basically, it has software that can be changed. You're all very well aware that uh, our computing power has increased ever since the dawn of computing. Uh, there's a little graph here uh, which shows you a little bit how things have evolved. You might be familiar with Moore's law, which basically says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit, so the circuit boards of computers, doubles about every two years, sort of resulting in doubling of computer speed every two years. Mm -hmm. Notice that the y-axis here is logarithmic, so it's not a straight line, it's an exponential evolution. So the question here is, will we actually arrive at the same computing power of a human brain and a computer anytime soon? So when did we first start thinking about AI? In the entertainment industry, the first movie to feature in AI is Metropolis. You see a little fragment of the movie here for you. It is a German silent film, so there's not much uh, to listen to. But it's being considered as the first feature-length movie of the genre to really feature in AI. So I'll just let you enjoy the fact in front of it.
Right, so that was quite different from modern day AI movies such as Her. Now, that's good for the entertainment business. When did academics, professors, researchers start thinking about AI? Well, uh, Vannevar's Bush seminal work, as we may think, is sort of considered as the start of this. Uh, Bush proposed a system that amplifies people's own knowledge and understanding. Shortly thereafter, or at least 10 years or 11 years afterwards, um, is when the first mention of AI came about. John McCarthy held the first academic workshop on the topic of AI. Everybody who attended sort of became a leader in the field for the next decades. We have people such as Minsky uh, attended. So um, this workshop, if we look at the, the proposal of this workshop, it is a study to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So it became a quite hot topic back in the 50s. One of the first applications that people look to is chess, because chess is something that we consider, you're, oh, you're quite intellectual, you're good at chess. I think there's this connection there. Uh, in 1951, the first chess um, solver was uh, developed. Okay. It was developed in the University of Manchester, and there have been some, uh, let's say, a lot of software attempts thereafter, but it wasn't until 1997 that Deep Blue beat one of the world champions in chess, called Gary Kasparov. Okay. So is this AI? Is it just a search problem that we've solved? Is chess actually a representative intelligent problem? Okay. In the words of Kasparov, Deep Blue was intelligent the way your programmable alarm clock is intelligent. Not that losing to a $10 million alarm clock made me feel any better. Now, a lot of other games we've solved using AI technologies. We have Checkers, Othello, Google's AlphaGo recently got solved or beaten, has beaten a human professional player only a few years back. But the real challenge in my view is role-playing games. Because there's a striking difference between being able to solve chess and an RPG. Because for the role-playing games, you need knowledge. So maybe a proper test for AI to see if AI is really intelligent is not its ability to beat a human in chess, but its ability to tell a compelling story, for which we need knowledge and understand that knowledge. So this brings us by, um, I think, one of the most famous tests for AI, though not without problems, would be the Turing test. Now, Alan Turing is the father of modern computing. I already mentioned the Turing completeness uh, a few slides ago. Um, but in his paper of 1950s, he talks about um, what makes a system intelligent? And he says to be called intelligent, the machine must produce responses that are indistinguishable from those of a human. So there's a very famous test whereby uh, a computer interacts with a chatbot, and it doesn't know if the chatbot is a chatbot or a human, and is supposed to not be able to tell the difference between the two. Now, it's not without its problems. Let's have a look. Alice is a... Uh, an artificial, linguist artificial linguistic internet computing entity, that's what it's short for. It was developed in 1995, and uh, it is basically a chatbot. It can answer you, an NLP system. Now, if we look at how it processes responses and answers them, you will see that the language processing is actually fine, but what's missing is knowledge. We ask it, who invented paper towels? It says the Chinese long before Europeans. Uh, who invented Barbie dolls? Thomas Edison. This is grammatically correct. It's asking a who question. You get a proper noun in return. Okay. 
but the knowledge doesn't make sense. So, other problems. What if, well, that's not a problem with the Turing test because that system wouldn't fool a human. But if we were trying to fool a human, there are some ways around it. What if they take the Fifth Amendment? See the example on the bottom left. The judge says, good day. Good day to you too. How old are you? That's a bit rude. How old are you? I'm not going to answer that. Old, young, it's irrelevant. I'm sure you're familiar with the Fifth Amendment. It basically says you have the right not to answer. So you can avoid the question. And in that way, you don't need to have knowledge. In another system that was widely advertised as having beaten the Turing test, the system or the software was meant to mimic a 13-year-old non-native English-speaking Ukrainian boy. Under those premises, the human interacting with the system actually knew that the, sp the speaker, the boy, wouldn't have perfect English, he would be from a different country, he's young, so he doesn't know too many things yet. So, for instance, can you tell me about the place where you live? Epsom, home of the Derby, yourself. My guinea pig says that the name Derby sounds very nice. So it would be sort of a, a response that maybe a young boy would give. It doesn't make sense as an answer, but it sort of makes sense as what a young people or a child would answer. All right. So before we go into answers and sort of novel ways of testing intelligence, let's have a look at neural networks. Neural networks were actually invented almost 80 years ago. And there's said to be three waves of neural networks, but the last wave having greatly enhanced what we see as artificial intelligence. It all started in the 50s and 40s, sorry, 40s and 60s, with the field we call cybernetics. Cybernetics actually stems from neuroscience. Neuroscientists um, were looking at how the brain functions, how we have perceptrons that are connected uh, through these nerve endings, and they sort of model the computer model after these perceptrons, and they called it artificial neural networks. Now, in next week's class, we're going to be going into detail on the perceptron model. So this is just going to be a broad overview. Um, what they did is they developed a sort of model that can mimic connections made in the brain. And they saw that, for instance, if you hold a triangle in front of someone's eye, you know, the neurons that correspond to those that triangle shape gets activated and they sort of per perpetrate throughout the network. So, the brain is sort of proved by example that intelligent behavior is possible. And they're trying to reverse engineer the brain in a computer. Or at least they're trying to mimic the brain in a computer. Here's a little video that I thought you might find interesting. The Thinking Machine. tonight is Professor Jerome B. Wiesner, director of the Research Laboratory of Electronics at MIT. Dr. Wiesner, what really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. Today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. I suspect if you come back in four or five years, I'll say, sure, but you do think. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? We're just really beginning to understand the capabilities of the computers. I've got some film to illustrate this point, which I think will amaze you. That man isn't playing checkers against the computer, is he? Sure, and it plays pretty well. Now, which color... While well, most computer scientists saw it as a mere number cruncher, a small group thought that the digital computer had a much grander destiny. Being a general purpose machine, it could be programmed to do things which in humans require intelligence. Play games like checkers and chess, and solve brain teasers. The field became known as artificial intelligence. Can machines really think? Even the 
scientists argue that way. I'm convinced that machines can and will think. I don't mean that machines will behave like men. I don't think for a very long time we're going to have a difficult problem distinguishing a man from a robot. And I don't think my daughter will ever marry a computer. But I think the computers will be doing the things that men do when we say they're thinking. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratory which is not too far from the robot that science fiction fame. They hadn't reckoned with ambiguity when they set out to use computers to translate languages. A $500,000 supercalculator, most versatile electronic brain known, translates Russian into English. Instead of mathematical wizardry, a sentence in Russian is to be fed in... One of the first non-numerical applications of computers, it was hyped as the solution to the Cold War obsession of keeping tabs on what the Russians were doing. Claims were made that the computer would replace most human translators. At present, of course, you're just in the experimental stage. When you go in for full-scale production, what will the capacity be? We should be able to do about, with a modern commercial computer, uh, about one to two million words an hour. And this will be quite an adequate speed to cope with the whole output of the Soviet Union in just a few hours computer time a week. When do you hope to be able to achieve the speed? If our experiments go well, then perhaps within uh, five years or so. And finally, Mr. McDaniel, does this mean the end of human translators? I'd say yes for uh, translators of scientific and technical material, but as regards poetry and novels, no, I don't think we'll ever replace the translators of that type of material. Mr. McDaniel, thank you very much. Okay, very interesting to see how they perceive uh, AI. Now, um, obviously, in the, in the 60s, AI didn't arrive, probably in, in these, these guys' lifetime, as they, as they were hoping. In fact, AI went into something that we call an AI winter in the 70s. AI winter, the term was inspired by the nuclear winter, because we sort of came from the 60s and the whole nuclear era. So in the history of artificial intelligence, an AI winter is a period of reduced funding and interest in artificial intelligence research. It wasn't until the 80s, mid-90s, that AI got a second boom. And it was not called cybernetics back then, it was called connectionism. Connectionism comes from cognitive science. So cognitive science is an interdisciplinary field that aims to understand the mind by combining different types of analyses. Okay. We had neural networks, these perceptron models, but they were very hard to train. You've seen the computers they had back in the 50s, machines like INIA. So it was too slow to train. In the 80s, connectionism, or the connectionists, invented something called backpropagation. Backpropagation uh, is when we, well, we'll look at this in, in much more detail in the next classes, uh, but it is a way to make our network train a lot faster. If we look at scientific papers that came out uh, related to AI over time, we see that the topic uh, called cybernetics was very popular in the 60s and 70s, and then Connectionism became popular sort of from the 90s. Now, connectionists focused on one particular problem, or at least they, they treated one particular problem, which is called XOR or exclusive OR. You're familiar with logic functions and or uh, not an XOR. XOR is one if one of the two inputs is one but only that. So we cannot model this with a linear model. You see the graph here, which basically shows the two points, which is zero, and the two points in which the model outputs one. We cannot draw a line between them to linearly separate them. Because if we do like this, the classes are not separated correctly. Same if we do something like this. So a linear model doesn't work. Interestingly, neural networks are not linear if they have multiple layers. So again, we go into the mathematics of, of how to calculate this later on. Since this model is nonlinear, we can 
actually train it using backpropagation so it works on a computer from that era, we can represent the XOR problem. Some other early connectionist models include models from Rummelhart and McLilland uh, who predict the past tense of English verbs. Okay. You know that most verbs that are regular just have ed added to the end of the verb, but some are irregular, like is, was, come, came, go, went. Okay. So the artificial neural network, DNN, learned the past tenses of uh, 460 verbs and it generalized fairly well. Interestingly, if it was trained on a small data set, it tended to uh, over-regularize and use the irregular form too often. Why is this? Because the most common verbs are irregular. So if you feed it a training set with a small number of uh, often occurring verbs, then the irregular form is going to be overrepresented. Okay. So this is easily corrected by adding more training examples. In this case, the network is better regularized. All right, so then again, these models sort of became too slow to do significantly new things, and we had to wait until 2006 when a number of things happened to pull us out of that AI winter. And importantly, it was new, better, faster techniques such as convolutional neural networks. We'll talk about this in the third week of classes. Uh, really layer-wise pre-training, whereby we sort of uh, pre-train the layers, layer by layer in a greedy way. And the rise of GPUs, which allows very fast matrix-based operations, which is exactly what we're doing in neural networks, we're sort of multiplying vectors all the time. And more data became available because data had been collected, set up through the internet, which came in the late 90s. All of these things allow for deeper networks, meaning neural networks with more layers. So with these deeper neural networks, they can outperform competing AI systems based on other technologies, such as the classic AI things you saw uh, with Prof. If you've read any article, uh, medium article, or whatever on AI, I'm sure you've heard these three names, which are often considered to be the godfathers of AI. It's Joshua Bengio, which is a professor at the University of Montreal. He invented uh, generative models, attention networks, transformers, word embeddings, there's Jeffrey Hinton, who works with Google because his uh, company DNN Research Inc. was acquired by Google. He's still at the University of Toronto as well. He is responsible for backpropagation mm -hmm. uh, and Boltzmann machines. Jan Le Kuhn was a PhD student of Jeffrey Hinton, and uh, he's now chief AI scientist at New York. Uh, sorry, at Facebook and works at New York University, NYU. All three of them uh, got a recent Turing Award, uh, and if you're interested to read a little bit more about what they think about the future of the field, I've linked a quite interesting uh, article which shows their vision, in which they share their vision at the recent Triple AI conference, which is sort of the flagship conference of the field of AI. Now, a question in everyone's minds maybe is: Will machines become self-conscious? because that would be the ultimate form of AI. If you ask me, not anytime soon. Because current day AI systems typically learn a model from a set of previous observations and just try to make predictions for unseen data. Most of the work is on something what we call narrow AI. Okay. Narrow AI is like a very particular task. Is this a dog or a cat? In this computer game, should I go left or right? It was a very narrow task, but the real challenge is coming to something that is called general AI, GAI. We'll talk about that at the end of the lecture. Um, if you ask Bengio, he says to reach a human level consciousness, we need better models of the world. We need to discover ca casual structures, causal structures, and explode them. Sorry, there's a typo, and we 
we, we need to generalize faster from fewer examples because a lot of problems in this world just don't have big training sets. Related to this, we need to expand on, on unsupervised techniques. Unsupervised means, for instance, uh, we can detect if something is a cat or a dog without having any labels, of, uh, any images of previous cats and dogs. All right. Now, before going into uh, current challenges, let's have a look at how AI is present in our lives today. Now, this is a very broad overview. We're going to go into detail in these techniques uh, in the later lectures. I just want to sort of give an overview of what type of applications there are. And the first one you're all very familiar with, I am sure, which would be vision, computer vision, images, image recognition, and the easiest form of this, object recognition. Sort of the hello world of object recognition is based on the MNIST dataset of Jan Le Kuhn, which is a handwritten dataset of numbers based on, uh, I think they got it from postal envelopes. And these numbers are just used to predict, is it 0, 1, 2, the total up and from that. Convolutional neural networks are a type of matrix-like structure Instead of looking at your neurons as one particular vector, you sort of look at the matrix in a whole and you're going to apply filters to on this. Is this an edge? Is this a face? Is this a nose? Etc. Okay. Uh, we'll have electron CNNs in details. It's hard to visualize this. I like looking at this video. So this illustrates a whole neural network. We have a matrix input of our image, and then it sort of perpetrates throughout the network, and it will predict you one of the ten classes. Okay. I think this is a very nice visualization. Each of the glowing lights would be an activated neural in your deep neural network. Oh, sorry. Now, in Convolutional neural networks, again, don't worry, we're going to go into detail. Uh, uh, people use filters, and the deeper you go in the network, sort of more detailed your filter becomes. So, um, these filters can be learned also automatically by the neural network. Based on all these convolutional neural networks, we have a lot of things that have become possible. We can recognize what is in images. There's a very famous ImageNet competition which has over a million images in it and over a thousand different objects that are being detected. And some very detailed, very deep architectures are, have been developed for this, which have basically revolutionized the whole industry. Okay. More on detail on that in uh, the electron CNNs. Once we have object detection, we can also do segmentation, find interesting parts. We can do pose detection, where is your skeleton? skeleton, we can detect emotion from face, etc, etc. Okay. In the next step, we can go take these image object detections, put them all together and bring them in autonomous vehicles, which is amazing and, and really a clever application to brings us that, that brings us one step closer to real world AI as people see it today. Automatic vehicles also include navigation. When we do navigation, what do we take into account? Is it as simple as looking at a map? No, there's lots of things. Is it the shortest path, the fastest path? Are there traffic jams? Um, how much gas do I have? Are there roadblocks, um, speed limit, limits, accidents, etc.? So in practice, these models that we're going to be developing in classes, CNNs, are actually going to be combined. They're going to be combined with rule sets, they're going to be combined with other neural networks to form a real-life implementation. Okay. Now, for instance, if I have an autonomous vehicle, I can give it a million images so that it can learn what a stop sign is. Or I can simply tell it, if you see a round uh, sign which says stop, you have to stop. Okay. So there's these shortcuts that we can implement in our neural networks by combining them with rule-based models to make things just work better. 
In the next level of routing, I'm hoping maybe we see some Amazon deliver, de deliveries with um, <clears throat> Prime Air, Air Taxis. I believe they're doing some testing in Singapore this year. And um, yeah, it's actually a very exciting field. Next, I want to talk very briefly about natural language processing. While there has been classic natural language processing, the main adva advance recently has been based on something called distributional semantics hypothesis, which is basically developed by John Rupert Firth, and it says, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Or we can look at it as words that occur in a similar context tend to have a similar meaning. Okay. What does that mean? Again, we're going to go into a little bit more detail later on. I enjoyed eating pizza at the restaurant. You shall know a word by the context it has. We'll know that something is pizza by looking at the company it keeps. What if we see in a whole bunch of uh, text, we also see I enjoyed eating pineapple at the restaurant. They have the same context. Do they have the same meaning? Not exactly. However, they're both foods that you can eat at a restaurant. So using these interpretations or these sort of search patterns, we can come to something which is called a, a word embedding model. In a word embedding model, people, not people, words are going to be put close together in this multi-dimensional space, depending on if they have and it, on if they occur in the same context together. That means that every word is giving a set of coordinates in a multidimensional space. And in our example, pineapple and pizza are going to have a close distance because they occur in a similar context. And we can interpret this as the fact that pizza and pineapple have a similar meaning. Okay. Now, there's been a, a bunch of models like this trained on, on Wikipedia and Google News, and we come to some very interesting conclusions. For instance, that if we do sort of translations, moving from one place to another in space, uh, we can actually change the meaning of a word. Like if we have a translation from man to woman, we see that if we do the same translation, the same angle from king, we arrive at queen. This is amazing, right? All right, uh, more on this when we uh, talk about our, our NLP models in probably next week. A similar model to the one I just showed you is called word to vec similar model is Globe model, comes to similar conclusions about these analogies or translations. Finally, due to these NLP word embedding models, there's been a lot of progress made in things like automatic customer support, meaning chatbots. <clears throat> in Singapore, they collected something called the National Speech Corpus, uh, which has 3,000 hours of locally accented, this is a very nice way of saying Singlish, uh, audio together with their tra text translation. For instance, OCBC Bank is using it in their chat box, not to not, to not just make I think she's called Emma, respond to you in a natural way, but also respond to you in your local accent. Um, Google has something called a WordNet. This is related to natural language processing. If you type in, an, uh, let's say, a famous person in Google, it sort of gives you on the right uh, some information about this per person, birthday, spouse, etc. Is because this is part of Google's WordNet and it recognizes that it's a painter or an actor. There have been a lot of advances in the field of NLP, but there are still things that a machine has trouble with. Think about sarcasm, sentiment. I mean, even data in Star Trek couldn't fully grasp emotions, right? So, can our AIs grasp emotions or not? What about logic reasoning? I fit in my jacket. 
my jacket fits in the shoe box, so therefore I fit in the shoe box. Right? How can we let machines understand that this is not the case? So we have tons of examples of AI in our lives. AI is pretty much everywhere. There's automatic trading, our bank analyzes our behavior. We have social media. Everything we see in our timeline basically comes from past searches, interactions you do, friends you have, etc. Healthcare, lots of image analysis there, gene analysis. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about some of my research, which is maybe a little bit less common to you, which is on AI and audio and music. First, uh, a study we did a few years back is on hit song prediction. In, if we look at the music industry, companies invest billions of dollars just to develop and discover new artists. The cost of breaking a single artist in a major market is about half a million to two million US dollars. So think of advertising costs, etc., to, to promote new artists. So having an algorithm which can tell you if a song is going to be popular or not, it's actually quite useful. So what we did is we extracted a big set of uh, hit songs, we got the audio for them, we did a bunch of analyses, and we got a system that gave us a percentage, based on the audio, the percentage of a song hitting the top 10 charts versus lower level positions. Pretty cool. We've expanded this because what makes a hit is really not just the audio. It's also what people are saying about the song, who is listening to the song. There's a group of people which we call early adopters, or maybe trendsetters. And we found that if we did an analysis of Last FM's listening behavior, we can actually um, identify users that have a sort of sixth sense. If they listen to hit songs, then the next week, guaranteed with 95% accuracy, we can tell you it's going to be in the hit charts next week if we see these people listening to it. So that's pretty cool. This study was done by analyzing the behavior of 2,000 users over the course of a few years. Are there important problems in the field of music, music transcription? So, any of you maybe use something like Cordify? You see a nice YouTube video, just paste the link, and Cordify will give you all the guitar chords so that you can strum along with it. Pretty cool. How does it work? Um, well, we did some research on music transcription. A little bit of a harder problem because we're trying to actually get transcriptions uh, MIDI transcriptions of full polyphonic songs. So we input spectrograms of audio, wave files, do some neural network magic, and we get actual transcribed notes. It's a hard problem. You can see this by our results. You can play your result. Here we have... Oh, let's see if this works. We have the original song. What does our network make of this? Uh, I have to tell you, we didn't focus on timing, so the timing of the notes is a little bit off. Well, actually, not so bad. It becomes harder if we're not using piano, but we're looking at string instruments. Original song. Transcribed version, uh, sorry, I think it's rendered in MIDI, so it sounds a bit different. So we got most mo notes, but not quite, not all quite there. Right. Uh, similar but very different sounding, is a study we did with Prof. Terming and Dr. He at KK Children's and Women, Women and Children's Hospital. Uh, we collected a bunch of cough sounds, and we tried to see if 
we could detect from the cough if something is asthmatic, uh, has an upper respiratory tract inf infection or a lower respiratory tract infection. Okay, here we have a normal cough. <coughs> here we have a URTI cough. <coughs> And here's an asthmatic cough. <coughs> These are a little bit... The asthmatic coughs are a little bit easier to, um, to classify because you hear the wheezing in the background. Similar architecture, we have um, uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, we combine them with uh, typical NFCCs and we get a pretty high accuracy. Some exciting research that we're working on right now is if we can classify emotion from music and video. So why is this important? Um, it's important because music has such a profound influence on your emotions, much more than video. Have a look at this example. This is a scene from Pirates of the Caribbean, the original music. Same clip, now it's scary music. Alright, how about with comical music? Isn't it interesting how emotion has such a strong influence on your perception? So how music has such a strong influence on your perception. Now in our projects we're creating emotion prediction models from the audio, from the video, and we're attempting to generate new music that you can steer with your emotion. One of the software that we actually have uh, predicts one emotion value per song and it allows you to sort of mark this on a graph. This is, I'm stressed right now. And you say, I want to feel energized. And the system will generate a playlist for you to guide you from one emotion to the other. The emotion prediction models that we use for something called triplet neural networks, which is a sort of dimension reduction techniques related to Siamese networks. Uh, but we won't go into detail about triplet neural networks in this class. Secondly, we also predicted emotion values at each half a second. This gives us the ability, so this time we used an LSTM, which is a type of RNN model, to make these predictions per time step. We'll go into RNNs later in this class. Uh, and this allows us to have people draw a valence and arousal graph, and we can match very detailed music. So think of video producers who need a fragment that is like relaxed, relaxed, climax, energetic, we can sort of use a search algorithm, combine it with our predictive algorithm, and give them very particular music. Um, finally, we're also predicting emotion models from both audio and video. Now this is very interesting because we're using, we're levering existing models from um, other, that we're training on other problems, such as ImageNet, and we're using these, we're using transfer learning to fine-tune these networks to a new task. Okay. So, for instance, on the video, we do object detection, scene detection, action detection, all of which have been pre-trained on their respective data sets, and then we apply them to our small emotion data set. I might bring this up again when we talk about for learning. All right, then we also have uh, music generation, which is the next step. So music generation is a very interesting problem, very difficult problem, because we all heard those little generated fragments from Google. It sounds good, but it's a very short time frame. Okay? If you really want to create an, a good music generation uh, 
software or model, it needs to take into account what we call uh, earworms, sort of themes, little repetitive themes that keep your attention. That's very hard to achieve. Secondly, we listen to music because we want to feel better, because we sort of got dumped and we want to be cheered up, or because we're running and we want to be more energized. Emotion is so intertwined. So we need to understand emotion before we can properly, properly generate music. So we're doing lots of tests in my lab to come to a, a new music generation model. I hope that some results of this uh, come out soon. So where is artificial intelligence going? Is it going towards artificial general intelligence, AGI? That's kind of the, the question. I talked about narrow AI versus general AI. Are we going towards AI systems like in the movie here? You see, it's a nice movie. So, general intelligence is considered intelligence of a machine that can understand or learn any intellectual task that the human being can. So we have our Turing tests, okay, but there would be better tests. For instance, Wozniak, Steve Jobs' uh, partner, the coffee test. A machine is required to enter an average American home and figure out how to make coffee. Find a coffee machine, find the coffee, at the water, find a mug, brew the coffee by pushing the coffee button. Was this a good test of AI? How about the robot college student test? A machine enrolls in a university, takes and passes the same classes that humans would, and get their degree. The employment test. A machine works in an economically important job and performs at least as well as humans in the same job. The flat pack furniture test. A machine is required to unpack and assemble an item of packed furniture. Think IKEA. The mirror test. Can a machine distinguish between a real object and its reflection from a mirror? Interesting. Now, suppose we do manage to get this AGI, or even before, what are the dangers of AI? I believe this is a screenshot of Black Mirror which definitely highlights some of the dangers of AI. One of them, which also became uh, apparent in a very old, very nice movie called Colossus, The Forbin Project, is what if AIs can manage to control our weapons and gain a mind of their own. They could literally hold the world hostage. Like Vladimir Putin said, AI is the future not only for Russia, but for all humankind. It comes with enormous opportunities, but also threats that are difficult to predict. So, we have to be careful. Our systems control everything. And once you deploy a robot on the battlefield, it might be difficult to actually dismantle it or change its programming if it gets hacked. Another uh, important danger is social manipulation. Right. AI systems, marketing uh, companies developing AI systems, or even worse, uh, countries and politicians developing AI systems might be very effective at target market. Okay. You remember the whole scandal with Cambridge Analytica and the firm that used the data from Facebook users to sway the outcome of the presidential elections and Brexit. AI is used, AI bots are used to spread propaganda. Very sad but reality. Uh, there's also concerns of evasion of privacy. Think of China's social credit system. China is giving its citizens a personal scores based on how they behave. You jaywalk, you lose points. Somebody doesn't like how you interact with them, they give you less stars. Think of the Black Mirror episode. This might lead to social oppression, and most of all, us being controlled by AIs and machines. It's important to keep track of your alignment between our goals and the machines. Do you know Asimov's three laws of robotics? Asimov, a great science fiction writer, uh, 
make three laws if we've been there for you. We have to make sure that AIs don't injure humans. If you would say to your self-driving car, get me to the airport as quickly as possible, well, the, the car needs to know that it needs to drive safely, right? Or it might just plow through other cars. So this is important, and we need to uh, keep this in mind when we're going to be developing more and more complex AI systems. AI can cause discrimination. It collects and analyzes so much data that it might be used against you. If an insurance company knows you're always on the phone, then it might be less willing to insure you for traffic incidents. Um, it's not all bad, of course. There are many benefits to AI. But we have to keep track, and we have to make sure that we do responsible AI development. You all know the arguments of Elon Musk. He's arguing for the regulation of AI development. And you might be right in doing so. Because as AI systems become more and more complex, it becomes more and more important to keep track and to regulate what they're doing and what they're being used for. That being said, that is sort of a very quick overview of the evolution of AI. And now we are ready to dive into some more neural networks uh, and machine learning first in the next classes.